Okay. Well, good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Dr. Michaela McKenzie from Atlanta, Georgia. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Dr. Christopher Shade. Dr. Shade was lucky enough to come and join us this afternoon and fill in, and we are so grateful for him. Dr. Shade earned a PhD from the University of Illinois, where he studied the environmental and analytical chemistries of mercury, as well as advanced aquatic chemistry. During his PhD work, Dr. Shade patented analytical technology for mercury speciation analysis and later founded Quicksilver Scientific, LLC. He has developed specific clinical and analytical techniques for measuring mercury exposure and a system of products for toxic metal removal. He also holds master's and bachelor's degrees from Lehigh University in environmental and aqueous chemistry. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Christopher Shade. Are we on? We are on. All right, I'm your substitute teacher today. That's not on? I don't know, it's playing up here. Work some magic, Dave. I don't know, it's on. All right, while Dave does that, uh, I'll ramble a little bit. So uh, they called me a couple of days ago and said, hey, can you come and fill in two different breakout sessions? And I'm always happy to come and talk, and I wasn't that far away. So I got up at 4.30 this morning, 4 a.m. this morning, and flew over here to talk to you guys, which I always love to do. And there we go, well, sort of. And slide that thing a little. As long as you don't mind half the slides. You're half assing it. Oh! Oh, yeah, it does look pretty funny up here, doesn't it? Once you exit out of it and start it again. Okay, so I'm going to cover two sessions today, roughly two hours, give or take. I guess they're two 50 minute sessions. So I pulled these from some things that I've done before. The first one is going to be a, a bit of a rehash of what I talked about in Vancouver last year. And so we're going to talk about the glutathione system with a long name like this as central mediator in combined disease of toxicity, chronic infection, and inflammation. So we're going to talk about inflammation in the body and glutathione and how this whole system sort of falls apart. and You get little glutathione and that leads to having chronic infections and chronic inflammation and all of the sort of chronic trouble that we talk about it. I'm just gonna try to frame it in, uh, well, a framework of the glutathione system. We all talk about glutathione, but we don't always talk about the glutathione system. So we'll talk about how things fall apart and how the detox system is supposed to work, how it's supposed to defend you against things like mercury. I mean, you all know the obvious, and the obvious is that some people are sick and some people are not sick. Some people are able to handle a large amount of a toxin like mercury and deal all right. They're a little batty, but they're all right. And other people are a mess. So we're just really, I mean, we've talked forever in vague terms about why we think this is, you're an excreter, you're not an excreter. We're going to try to put names to as much as we do know about it and realize that this is an evolving field and there's a lot of things coming to light. We like to talk about genes and uh, genomic profiles and Genova had a profile a couple of years ago, the detoxygenomic profile. And it was a good, you know, 1% of the whole playing field of the genes involved in this. Uh, and we tend to get stuck on those. So just remember this is all a work in progress. So first one, we're going to talk about all the basics of how the system's supposed to work, how it falls apart. In the second one, I think there's an hour in between, so maybe it's the third breakout session, uh, I'll talk more about testing for mercury and uh, the nuts and bolts of how you get the system's defense back up to protect yourself and detoxify mercury. So in part one, we'll talk about the detoxification system, what its architecture is in general, the disruption of the detoxification system, how that falls apart. Then we'll talk about really what the detox system is part of a larger system that I call the antioxidant detoxification protein repair system. So we can start to see this orchestration that's going on and then we'll talk a little bit about what toxicity means and 
uh, really what synergism of different toxins is. I mean, one of the hardest things is when you find somebody who's really sick, but they don't have a lot of mercury. How do you explain that? And I'm going to give you a little bit of a framework for understanding uh, how mercury works transgenerationally to create weakness in the system and how previous exposures could be your mom's exposures, could be exposures early on, could be exposures for you during dental school can set up a long-term weakness in your system which makes you susceptible to a lot of different toxins. So as I said, part two then we'll talk about testing and how to repair the glutathione system. You know, kind of a staple in all my uh, presentations, it's almost like my hello slide is this slide here. And if you've ever seen me talk before, you'll see this come up first. And this is one basic first cut at looking at why there's such a difference in people's ability to deal with mercury. And what you'll see here, uh, and you probably can't read this, this is from uh, 1973. There was a poisoning episode in Iraq, and they got to track how this population was, that was exposed responded to mercury in terms of moving it out of the system. And this is the half-life in days versus the frequency of the population. And you see this half-life move from 40 days through the, you've got a couple of people fast detoxifiers at, at 40 days. You've got the median running at a half-life around 60 days and the slow ones around 100 days. And that's in the nice histogram. And then the nice histogram blows up when the blue-blooded Martians come in and we look at them and they're having a really hard time with mar mercury. Obviously, it's all Mars. It's all iron and Mars, not mercury. And, uh, and this genetic subset here is running about 120 days. And it's a big genetic subset. I mean, it's amazing they didn't talk more about that. But it's about 12% of the population running as super slow detoxifiers. And we can, we can guess that that's a, a genetic group there because it, it's so distinct. And so it's the slow and the super slow detoxifiers that we're seeing in practice that come, that need amalgams taken out, that need some intervention to get them well. And this is some mix of genetic uh, polymorphisms. This is what we like to talk about a lot. You know, are you a SNP for GST M1, T1? Are you a MTHFR, uh, 677 double mutation? What kind of SNP are you? But in reality, you can have a perfectly good pair of genes fed to you, and then you can screw them up. You can, you can turn them off, and you can behave as if you had a perfectly bad set of genes given to you. So it's important to know the functional expression, which is also sometimes called epigenetics. And we're going to see other things that turn down detoxification, like inflammation. And maybe we could call that epigenetics too, because when we look at how to fix things, we're going to look at how to express genes that we want to express. Uh, I talk a lot about inflammation and detoxification. And for a long time, this was a paper on fish consumption, low-level mercury, lipids, and inflammatory markers in children. And what you see laid out here is as mercury goes up, inflammation goes up. And we always like to say things like, see, mercury causes inflammation. But when I want to rework this and show you how inflammation turns down detoxification, then we can flip this around because in science we know correlation is not causation. We just choose an axis. We can flip it around and we can say, look, as inflammation goes up, mercury goes up. But now it doesn't matter how you got to the top end of the scale. You've got high inflammation and high mercury. Things are bad. And uh, this is adrenal stress index. And the guys in the upper quintiles here have uh, a blunted adrenal, uh, adrenal response. So you, you see the damage from that. To skip to the chase on what is metal resistance, and uh, I know you can't read this here, but maybe you'll get a copy of these slides somewhere. They've got to be all over the Internet at this point. This is my favorite slide in terms of how do we set up resistance to mercury. What does resistance mean? And this was done at a cellular level. It's a very pure, like the smallest little organismal level we can work at. And they got cell cultures, and, and what 
Cell biologists used to do is get cell cultures and expose them to x-rays or something that mutates them. And they get, you know, from one cell, they generate a whole bunch of cells with slightly different genetic expression. And they search then through all their cells for a cell that can do what they want. And then they take this cell apart and they say, what's the chemistry in the cell that allows it to do that? And so they were looking for metal resistance. And they looked through all these mutant cells. And they found cells that could swim in cadmium. So they had them in 5 micromolar cadmium, which is a lot of cadmium. And it didn't seem to bother them. It would kill the other cells, but it didn't kill these cells. And so then they tried them out on a couple other metals, and they found that they could swim in mercury and arsenic too. So you got cells that can live in cadmium, mercury, and arsenic. So what was it about the cells that the metals didn't go in and cause all these problems that they cause in so many other situations? And they found three basic things. Maybe we could say four, but we'll talk about the three because three of them are within the glutathione system. And they found that they had High activity of MRP-like transport. MRP-like transport, what's that? MRP means multi-drug resistance proteins. And they're proteins that are detoxification proteins. They take stuff from the inside and ship it to the outside. So they take it from inside the cell to outside of the cell. But what do they take? They take conjugates of toxins, in this case metals, that are conjugated with glutathione. So also in this cell, along with the transport, they had these little numbers here. What they're talking about there is glutathione as transferase. That's an enzyme that links glutathione onto these metals. And the last thing, of course, they needed was a lot of glutathione. So they made a lot of glutathione. They had a lot of this linking protein that gets the metals away from the proteins. And they had the shipping proteins that take them out. Now, I'm always told to tone it down, tone down the science, tone it down, tone it down, tone it down. I think that's pretty toned down. You need glutathione, you need an enzyme that pulls the metals away from the proteins and links it onto the glutathione, and then you need the bouncer at the door that ships it out. And then when they went in and they shut down any one of those functions, the cell lost that ability that ability to have those three things happen. Now fortunately when we go into talking about the ways later that we get the cells to do this, the more we get into this journey in this science, the more we see that a lot of things that we thought were different or disparate are triggering genes in us that bring those different, those three main things out and make them function in us. And I'm going to show you data that shows that there's a gene set that's responsible for chemo protection. And if you come to me, I'm going to use a couple different plant chemicals and lipoic acid, and I get that gene set. And I can say, oh, I'm better than you, DMSA and DMPS, because you do blah, 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 these things I don't like. You, you stir up the pot too much. But then there's a lot of cases where, yeah, well, you know, we gave this, you know, autistic kid DMPS and we healed him. We gave these people DMSA and we healed them. We got some metals out. There wasn't that many, but it must have been just enough. Well, guess what? In the literature, we find evidence that DMPS and DMSA can also hit these same gene triggers. Because what I'm going to try to get across to you is it's not good enough to just tie up the metal. We have to fix the function of the system underneath. And then, well, those functions are all antioxidant functions. But what do we find? Where's Frank Schallenberger? We, we find that ozone hits these triggers. Where's Boyd? Is that Boyd in the back? There's Boyd. I talked to Boyd years ago, and I said, yeah, you should look and see if you upregulate glutathione as transferase with that molecule. And what does it do, Boyd? upregulates glutathione as transferase by hitting these gene triggers that turn on these family of good actors. So really in your development of treatment it's about which of these ways do we turn on these genetic expressions that are going to save us that are most in line with the other things that we want to do for the body. Do we want to kill some Lyme disease, some fungus, maybe we want to go with ozone. Do we have a multitude of metals that are in the brain, maybe we want something like OSR, or, or I forget the new name for it. 
does, does the patient want to stick with plant-based medicine? Well, then we should go with polyphenol. So I'll try to give you a lot of tools that you can use, but this is the basis of it. You need intracellular glutathione sufficiency. You need effective glutathione as transferase activity, and you need the phase three, this clearance out. Now, when I started lecturing back in, oh, I, I have a time problem. I, I don't know when that was. I started lecturing 2009 at Klinghardt's uh, chemical, chemical and Heavy Metal Symposium, and I started talking about phase three, which is this transport out. And the only reason people hadn't talked about it before they talked about phase one, phase two, is that it had really recently been discovered. But it's the clearance out, mostly through the GI tract. And when that's blocked, everything gets blocked behind it, which explains why treatment modalities like colonics and anything you do to clean up your GI tract has such a far-reaching influence in your body. And it explains my, my new love is bitters, cocktail bitters. Cocktail bitters were all the rage around at the turn of the century. It was, you know, the cure for what ails you. And what are they? They're things that make you squeeze your liver and squirt bile out. And what else goes on those bile transporters? But the toxins go through the bile transporters too. So that's why they make you feel better. And I used to recommend drainage remedies, but a lot of drainage remedies really are bitters. And so these things that we can start to see the biochemical basis for a lot of our naturopathic treatments. So let's talk a little bit about detoxification phases. We've got phase one, two, and three. Phase one and two were talked about for a long time. Phase three came along recently, but was the obvious conclusion to them. Phase one is called an activation. Phase two, a conjugation. And phase three is that transport out. And phase three is most associated with the cytochrome P450. I remember, you know, as integrative medical people were we love the latest and greatest. And when researchers were looking at cytochrome P450, that was, you know, everything. Everything was cytochrome P450. Eventually, that became a, a bad thing. Uh, and I'll see one of the, I'll tell you one of the reasons that this can be a problem. Phase one creates free radicals. It takes a chemical which isn't reactive enough to t tack it onto glutathione or something like glutathione, turns it into a free radical so you can link it onto glutathione. So if you have that running, uh, if you have that running really fast, but you don't have that conjugation part, then you're creating free radicals that are causing damage inside you. So we say not needed for metals because metals are immediately reactive. They don't need this uh, roughing up is what Bob Walker calls it. But you call it, you're creating a free radical. And then in breast cancer, they've developed out very clearly a lot of the ways it happens through having overactive phase one creating estrogen free radicals, not being coupled to phase two to link it with something to take it out. So phase two is that linking, it's to make this thing water soluble and recognizable by the transport proteins and GST is our hero in the story of mercury and of course they do find that it's low in people who accumulate a lot of methylmercury back when nurses used to use a lot of thimerosal, uh, nurses that uh, became sensitive to it and got rashes, they found that they had uh, deficits in glutathione as transferase. And you can look at those, you know, we like to look at those genetically, but again, there's epigenetics. And as we move forward, when we find real nice testing panels, we're going to see that we're testing a lot of the crucial enzymes. Uh, as well as not just looking at the genetics, but looking at how the enzymes work, looking at how all the players are working. And, you know, we're just a little bit slow getting there. Getting there to having a full panel. So I'll, tell, I'll talk about later about what we do have. Uh, so the transport out, these are different transport proteins. They're all really kind of the same thing. They used to be called organic anion transport proteins. Eventually, the drug companies realized that some people detoxify chemotherapy too fast, and the chemotherapy doesn't work. So they went and researched them in and out, which was good that they researched them in and out. But they actually saw them as a nuisance, and they called them multidrug resistance proteins, and they made drugs to stop them. Oh, well. 
at least they research them for us because then we can do this kind of, we can put these kind of things together. So this is a real important thing. When we look at this structuring of phase one, two, three, phase one, there's a lot of different enzymes. Phase two, there's a handful of different enzymes. And phase three, there's only really one transporter out. So it funnels down. So if the transport isn't working, everything backs up behind it. This is why if the liver isn't moving, the bile isn't moving, the body is not doing good. So if we look at this schematically, uh, here's the sort of engineer's diagram. Everything above my cursor there uh, or above my laser is inside the cell. And inside the cell we have these reactions, phase one, the oxidative activation, moving things into phase two, the link it together, and then phase three. The MRP1 takes it from the cell to the blood. Then it moves from there and goes through the organic anion transport pr protein, another phase three transporter, and then through MRP2, through the bile duct and into the small intestine. Now some of this also goes through the kidney. Now in the kidney this is not glomerular filtration. This happens, this is active transport into the proximal tubules after glomerular filtration. When we talk about testing, I'll show you where we see people who can't move mercury out into the urine. This is damage in the tubules, not the glomerulus. They may still have fine GFRs, but not be able to move metals. Sometimes they have damage on both. But the biggest path here overall is the liver path. And if we look at it more holistically, this is happening in the cell. We have reactions. We move out through the membrane. Now, I said to the blood before, but really it's through the extracellular ma matrix. And I could talk ad nauseum about the extracellular matrix. I have a t-shirt at home that says, I love the extracellular matrix. And uh, but that's all nutrients have to flow through the matrix and all waste has to throw, flow out of the matrix to get to the blood. And when people talk about things like acidification, they're not talking about the blood. Oh, I'm acid. They're talking about the lymphatics and the extracellular matrix. And there's this intricate network of antenna-like things in there that have these negative charges at the end of them that keep them soluble and open and have this hyper-structured world in which they move all these nutrients and waste. And when you acidify them, those little negative charges go away and they collapse on themselves and you create uh, a gel in here that you can't move through. So that's very important. And then again from the blood you get out to the liver or to the kidneys, to the small intestine. So in green is these phase three movements. So methylmercury specifically goes out conjugated to glutathione and then through the liver, through the bile, into the intestine. Now unfortunately, when you first absorb methylmercury as fish, you're, you're absorbing it as methylmercury cysteine. It's bound to cysteine residues in the protein. When you hydrolyze that, the methylmercury sticks with the cysteine, and it's a molecular mimic for methionine, the essential amino acid. So you have 95% uptake through the GI tract, you have movement across the blood-brain barrier, the placental barrier, you think you've got methionine. Now, you conjugate it to glutathione, and glutathione is one-third cysteine, and when it goes out here, you have transpeptidases that break it down, and you're left with methylmercury cysteine, which you reabsorb. So that's called enteropatic circulation. You're just kind of doing this constantly. So when we talk about treatment, we talk about breaking enterohepatic circulation. What can we put through the GI tract that grabs the mercury before it gets reabsorbed? When we talk about inorganic mercury, there is what I call a 50-50 split between the kidneys and the GI tract. Now, I know there's a lot of different teaching out there about this and where it goes. A lot of people, especially in the IO IOMT lineage have taught 90% of all mercury goes through the GI tract. Uh, if we had time, I'd show you a lot of data that supports that at least 50% is going out through the kidneys. When we have problems in the tubules and the transport through the kidneys, it is exceptionally difficult 
to get the inorganic mercury down no matter how fast we're pulling methylmercury out through the liver. And uh, at some point I'll track back to where I believe the, the problem uh, in interpretation of where inorganic mercury goes between them was. But in my teaching it's uh, roughly 50-50. So now how does that detox system get disrupted? So we talked about these phases going down to the GI tract. Now when we inflame the GI tract, there is a feedback on that transport protein and the activity of that transport protein turns way down. When that happens, there is a negative feedback back on phase two. So phase three gets turned down. Phase two has nowhere to go with its products, and it turns down two. Now, unfortunately, a lot of our different reactions are kind of tied together, but some of them aren't. And phase one doesn't seem to be tied in with phase two and phase three. So phase two and phase three turn down together, but phase one chugs on remember creating free radicals. In the breast cancer story that was developed, uh, Eleanor Rogan and some other researchers at John Hopkins really nicely elucidated this and estrogen was going through phase one but then not being conjugated to glucuronic acid and taken out of the system. And it was building up and it was abstracting DNA base pairs and they found in these women high amounts of estrogen DNA adducts in the urine. And how did they fix that? Well, of course, they wanted to make a drug, but they found that plant compounds, phytochemistry worked real well, specifically compounds that turned up phase two to match phase one. And I know, John, you probably have used those old, uh, Genova had some uh, test kits where they look at phase one and phase two being matched and doctor's data has one. I don't know if Genova still has their, theirs, but it was a good way to see what that balance was there. Now everybody asked me for a measure of how phase three is working and I have not figured out what that measure is yet. But in this picture here, you can see the picture of chronic disease. If we take an end member of chronic inflammatory disease like autism, what, internal free radical generation, no detoxification, no movement out of the cells and out of the body and inflamed GI tract? And now we're starting to see the more we test, the more people we look at. Some people have really, really low, hard to measure mercury levels, but they sure seem toxic. And as you treat them, these tend to be so far mostly methylation problem people. And John brought one up to me this morning. They seem to be stuck at the cellular level. They're not getting it out of the cells. So no matter what we measure, the blood, the urine, anything, I don't care if you challenge it, don't challenge it, you're not going to see the mercury in there until you fix some of these processes to move it out into circulation. So when we talk about detoxification, there is the squeezing of the cell to go from the cell to the lymph and blood. And that's where we want to get it so the filters can work on it. The filters being the liver, the kidney, the GI tract. So we're going to learn how do we get, provoke it from the cell to the blood and lymph, and then how do we keep the filters running to lower those levels. Uh, this is a good crew for this. Amalgam has a great way to create this problem. Now, for years we talked only about the amount of amalgam that you inhale, which is what gets into your bloodstream. You have 80% uptake of any of the vapor that comes off of there. But there's corrosion going on all the time, and Huggins used to talk about the corrosion products, and he had some number of them, like the 37 different corrosion products. For me, the most significant corrosion product is inorganic mercury oxidizing off of that surface that you then swallow. When you swallow it, you don't inhale a lot, but what you do have go through the GI tract changes the flora in the GI tract and creates little inflammatory zones. In fact, when they did feeding studies on methylmercury versus inorganic mercury, they said, well, the methylmercury kills the animals quicker, so people thought it was worse, but the inorganic mercury just ulcerated their GI tract. So that's what you're, you're getting, the ulceration through here, the inflammation in the GI tract, while you inhale the other form 
that's, uh, that's being absorbed into your bloodstream. Uh, this is probably more biochemistry than you want to know, but the long and short of it is this is inflammation caused in the GI tract turning down the detox transporters. And they injected endotoxin into mice, and then they looked at these genes throughout the mice. And so this is duodenum, jejunum, ileum, colon. They turned down the transport proteins all across the GI tract by putting endotoxin into the mouse. Now, endotoxin, we know, is a great inflammatory mediator, but now new research that's coming out is showing that endotoxin's inflammation goes out of hand in the presence of mercury. What else do we know about endotoxin? Uh, I think I have slides later to show you, but endotoxin and mercury are synergistically toxic. Where would we be getting endotoxin in a dental situation? Did I hear a lot of root canal? Cavitations, root canals. And then if we extend up into the nasal cavity, all the infections in the nasal cavity. But what's the, you know, the, all the rage in nat naturopathy and, uh, and integrative medicine now? Leaky gut. And so whenever we're getting endotoxin and mercury at the same time, we're creating a really damaging scenario. And I'll show you more about that. But down in here, these are different pathways in the liver. And when you create that inflammation, all the pathways that go from the liver to the small intestine turn down, and the one that goes from the liver back into the blood to go to the kidneys stays open. So when you blow out the gut, you rely on the kidneys. And so when we've created this problem here, we redirect to the kidneys, and then if we're especially redirecting the metals and the lipopolysaccharides, the endotoxin, then we burn out the ability of the kidney to keep filtering that. And now we've lost both of our filters, or all three, liver, GI, kidney. And now we've got everything stuck inside. And just so you know, the first part's the bad news. Part two will be better news. All right, let's skip through that. Let's go into the super system. Antioxidant detoxification, protein repair, super system. Lots of enzymes in there. I don't want to get too functional medicine on you, but we talk about all these antioxidants that we love. Glutathione, well, I talk about thyroidoxin. Not many people do. Uh, lipoic acid, vitamin C, vitamin E, CoQ10. None of these do anything in your body unless these enzymes on the outside drive them into their functions. So glutathione is, is our hero here. It's glutamate, glycine, and cysteine. It's got that sulfhydryl group, sulfur and a proton there. And the proton goes away and the metal comes in. That's how that works there. And also, if the proton goes away with electrons, then it's acting as an antioxidant. So in the context of mercury, cadmium, or arsenic, they bind onto those metals and make complexes that get sh sent out. Now, it's important that we think, when we're talking about glutathione, about the glutathione system, which, just to give you a list, is synthetases, transpeptidases, transferases, peroxidases, reductases, redoxins and glutathione inhalation, which is putting glutathione onto things to signal different events to happen. So glutathione is not just a single antioxidant. Glutathione is a system that does a lot of different work. And while we're talking about antioxidants, let's just hit this basic. We have exogenous and endogenous antioxidants. And exogenous are things we're taking in either by way of diet or supplementation. Endogenous are things that we make on the inside. Of, of those two, which do you think is more potent? The stuff from the food or the stuff we make in our cells? Oh, well, that was easy. The stuff we make in the cells is far more potent. And the machine that drives it all into action are these different enzymes. Now, plant compounds, plant-based antioxidants, I'm going to posit to you here, aren't really even antioxidants. They don't do jack in terms of antioxidant activity in your blood. What is it they do? 
they stimulate this system here. This is leading me to show you that plant-based antioxidants do the same things that ozonides do and ozone does. So, those enzymes, you've got antioxidant enzymes, say we're talking about glutathione and we've got lipid peroxidation, we've got glutathione peroxidase to use the glutathione to quench the peroxidase. Then you've got oxidized glutathione, you've got to bring it back into the reduced pool. We have far more reduced stuff than oxidized stuff and when that t balance tips, we have problems. So the reductases bring it back into the reduced pool. Uh, thyroidoxin and glutaridoxin are phenomenally interesting systems that have this whole control on turning on and off the function of proteins. Many proteins are turned off when there's strong free radical pressure around and turned back on when the pressure goes away. But if the pressure doesn't go away right, and then here is what I just said, so glutaridoxin covers thiol sites during oxidative stress situations to protect them and this shuts off temporarily the function and then they can take the glutathione back off and make it an active protein again. But if the redox potential in the cell is not restored, if you don't bring that highly reduced situation back in, the proteins don't go back on so there can be very, very long lasting effects. Thyroidoxin, we're going to skip that, that's going to be a little bit too much. But the mitochondria now, this goes back to our metal story. So the mitochondria have all these super enzymes to make all this stuff happen. But you make different enzymes in the mitochondria than you make in the cytosol. That's because the mitochondria is a special place. So it's, it's burning up all this fuel and there's a lot of reactive oxygen species around. And it's actually more reduced in there than it is in the cytosol around it, but there's more explosions of reactive oxygen species. So they make the enzymes there able to tolerate the reactive oxygen species, but there is a trade-off. And the trade-off is that they become more susceptible to oxidation by mercury, cadmium, and arsenic. That's why one of the biggest hallmarks of heavy metal toxicity is fatigue, or in a larger sense, mitochondrial dysfunction. So mitochondrial dysfunction is a mitochondria that usually would take nutrients and oxygen into the electron transport chain to burn up fats and create lots of ATP and a little bit of reactive oxygen species. But a damaged mitochondria creates very little ATP and a lot of free radicals because the electron transport chain has been decoupled. Metals are really good at that. We won't go through this too much, but this was uh, data on autism. Again, an end member of this biochemical problem. And they found glutathione deficits in them, but the deficits were exaggerated in the mitochondria. And then we get to the last part of our system, and that's detoxification, and that's the phase two and phase three. And you'll find most of the great research on this in cancer journals and they would state very openly that the purpose of this system was the removal of the free radical generating offender from the cell before it could create mutations. So how does the system break down? You can have deficiency of glutathione or, or the phase two enzymes. These could be genetic or environmental, or maybe we could say genetic or epigenetic. Or we could have a breakdown of phase three. And remember phase three, everything's funneling down into phase three. So when phase three's stuck, everything's stuck. Uh, and in fact, age is one of our breakdowns, as we all know here. And I know you can't read any of this here, but this is young and old rats. And as these rats age, this was, all of a sudden people started doing more papers like this where they would take a young rat population or an old rat population. Because before that, you take all these newborn rats that are totally perfect, it's hard to really damage them. And so if you're trying to do toxicology studies, you don't get a good feel for what a real toxic dose of stuff is. But in an old rat, you get 20 to 35% drops in antioxidant function. You get 
uh, 35 to 50 percent drops in antioxidant enzyme function. So when we get into uh, talking about repair of the system, we'll look back at that paper and how they repaired that system. Now, just to cycle this back around to brain, neurotransmitters, one of the biggest neurotoxic manifestations of mercury is excess of glutamate, the NMDA receptors, NDMA receptors. And they create uh, proxy nitrate radicals in the brain, which create anxiety and brain fog. And this is middle age and old neurons. Here, going down is good. This is more and more reduced. So the neurons get more oxidized with time. Now, the other graph, they flipped it around. So more reduced is on the top. This is embryonic, middle-aged, and old, and you see these are becoming more oxidized. But if they put a little bit of glutamate in, it oxidizes much, much faster. So getting into the glutamate excess phase puts you into neuroinflammation, which rapidly uh, eats up the brain. So this will be more part of the part two, how we fix things, and this is a gene trigger to turn on the chemoprotective genes I talked about in the beginning. And what does this? Well, phytochemicals is what I always used to talk about. The polyphenolic antioxidants, green tea extract, pomegranate extract, and then the literature chugs on and chugs on and chugs on, and then all of a sudden this paper shows up and they say, oh yeah, uh, when they when the polyphenols get the NRF2 to release into the nucleus and turn on all the good genes, it's actually a free radical reaction. It's actually a pro-oxidant reaction that happens there, not an antioxidant reaction. In fact, this mechanism is there to protect against overt oxidative stress. And so now you're seeing a flip from when we were way into antioxidants and really drove that too far, used too much vitamin A, vitamin E, actually increased cancer rates. Now we're into a pro-oxidant craze where we love ozone. There's MLM products like ASEA that are pro-oxidants. People even sell bleach these days as a supplement. And that's because these pro-oxidants hit this switch and turns on all this good stuff. And then I find even more data showing DMPS and DMSA do it. I look at Boyd's data. I know that the same switch is getting hit by OSR. And as we go in, we, I spend a lot of time with the autism community. These are all just different free radicals uh, and reactive oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur species that are in the body. And having the right uh, association of them is what's going to keep us healthy. All right, so I'm going to show you. We've got five more minutes, and uh, I've got about two hours of stuff to cover, so I'm going to speed up. All right. Targets of mercury, we all know, brain, kidney, liver, heart, all the glandular system. Here's a big problem, transgenerational dysfunction. And uh, this is what I talked about a lot in Vancouver. I opened up with saying, oh my God, I'm so tired of talking about mercury. Boyd agreed with me. Because a lot of the times when people come to you and they're feeling toxic and they want to know where is my mercury, you know, I must have a lot of mercury, sometimes they're not even exposed to too much mercury. But previous exposures are causing transgenerational dysfunction. Uh, I did a study on, I helped some people do a study on frogs when, where they found that first generation of frogs exposed to mercury didn't really have an effect. But then if they took the second generation and exposed them to the same dose of mercury, half of them died. You'd think this would have made some news. I mean, it was done by really good researchers, and the guys were like, oh, wow, isn't that cool? But that really says a lot for a population that's in their third generation of having three-quarters of the population with amalgams if each generation is getting successively weaker against what's going on. All right, so we're going to skip that and go right into this. This is a little bit more of the same thing. So antioxidant system breakdown in the brain of this fish as an effect of mercury exposure. You expose the eggs to mercury, 
And then when the eggs grow up, no more mercury, but the glutathione system is weak for the rest of the fish's life. The rest of the fish's life. Not like the first two months and then it repairs. The rest of its life. And so they looked at it, they say, well, it doesn't appear to be damaged. But tell me, what's the consequence to that fish when he swims downstream and there's real high cadmium levels? So he got exposed to mercury as an egg. Now he's got a weakness against all toxins and he swims into the next pool of toxins and he takes that one and then the next pool and he takes that one and that one and that one and that one. And then the soup of toxins become far more damaging to him. This was uh, on mice and it was prenatal methylmercury exposure. They had the mother and then the pups exposed to mercury, no, the mother exposed to mercury while she was pregnant, then they took away the mercury. After a couple of weeks, there's no difference in whole body mercury between the exposed and the unexposed pups. But the glutathione system in the previously exposed pups did not develop correctly and they were left at a deficit for the rest of their lives. A deficit of their protection system. I mean, it starts to explain why we have so many issues these days despite having everything we need. And we'll skip a little bit through that. Uh, this was talking a little bit more in this fall down of the system in the immune dysregulation. A lot of people have this Th1, Th2 shift. Th1 is your ability to evade viruses and funguses. You're innately born with that. It's your innate immune system. The acquired immune system is a little bit allergic, more allergic light, and things like food sensitivities fall into that side. And so a lot of people get disrupted towards having low Th1, excess Th2. All these people that come in and they have all these viral problems, all these fungal problems, but they can't eat anything. That's one of the consequences of this breakdown. And this is a study, look, at this is interferon. This is your greatest antiviral. And when, this is when glutathione, they fed it an alcohol diet. Uh, this expands, explains why people get flus after weekends of uh, partying too much. But when the glutathione went down, interferon went down, and IL-4, which is one of these sort of food reactivity toxins, went way up. All right, she's kicking me off the stage. What do we got here, 30 seconds? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on, before she kicks me off the stage, I have to read a disclaimer. Okay, I do not have any financial interest in a product in this talk. I will have financial interest in products and services that are talked about in the second, second side. All right, can I finish one more slide here? All right. This is part of getting two days notice. I got too many slides here. All right, so let me just leave you with this picture here, and then we'll pick everything up in the afternoon. But in this movement into the disruption of the system, you have toxicity moving into immune dysregulation, which is seen as raised Th2, lowered Th1, which is going to give you chronic infection from the lowered Th1, food allergies and hypersensitivities from the raised Th2, both of those leading to more inflammatory process, and the inflammatory process further depressing detoxification you're going to move into vascular permeability. You're going to bring lipopolysaccharides into the system. Uh, fortunately, I told you, so I don't have to show you. Uh, when those lipopolysaccharides come in along with the mercury, the ability of the kidney to get rid of mercury goes away, and the whole body mercury goes way up. You also have vascular neurovascular permeability, leading to different uh, neuroinflammatory problems. You can have uh, cardiovascular problems, this whole host of different things that goes on when you get into that downward spiral. So in the second half, we'll talk about testing and how to reverse that spiral. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris Shade. If we could give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And if you'd like to hear him.